tonight, and we're looking at three particular words, sin, iniquity, and transgression, uh, from the approach of the Hebraic mind that we find in Scripture. And I think a really good place for us to start in looking at how these concepts interact with each other is going to be found in Exodus 34. We'll get to that in a minute, but um, just in case you're like me, raised in the church, and hearing these words thrown around with each other, sometimes in the place of each other, and altogether um, hear them put in the conversation of what Jesus fixes, it's easy to conflate them and say, well, sin is another word for iniquity, and it's another word for transgression, which is another word for abomination. And while there are clearly big similarities between them, there's also some big differences. And sin uh, between these big themes can become almost like an evil main character in our view of the narrative of scripture and the purpose of the human story, when in reality, there's probably a bigger purpose than just fixing sin. Um, and so to understand that purpose and to live through it, it's really important for us to better understand what exactly sin according to the Bible is. And that's where seeing these other words in play will really help. So if we jump to Exodus 34, I'm going to read for you this quick passage of what God says about himself to Moses in the second giving of uh, the law, not the Deuteronom uh, Deuteronomy second giving, but the second attempt to uh, instruct Israel after their enormous failure, their great sin of worshiping a golden calf at the base of Mount Moriah. So this is that second large conversation God has with Moses at Moriah and uh, sorry, not Moriah at Sinai. And this is what he says. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. So here we find those three particular words, chata, which means sin, avon, which means iniquity, and pesha which is translated transgression. Now, God is not just using three random synonyms for bad stuff that we do. In fact, there are many other words he could use, but we find these three very often grouped together in contexts like this. And we know that through the rest of Torah, God will go on to explain through Moses how to deal with these particular problems in ourselves, in our community, and ultimately through the whole arc of scripture for the entire world. But let's start with that first broadest term that sometimes gets put in the place of the others. Chata, which we translate as sin. What is that? Well, it's taken from the verbal root that sounds pretty much the same. Chata, which means to make a mistake or to fail at your objective. Uh, we know there are some contexts where it's actually not that bad of a, of a word. It really just means to, to mess up. We have an example in Judges, chapter 20, verse 16 where it says that there are many sling throwers who are left-handed, by the way, for any lefties out there, who could sling a stone at a hair and not yechati, not miss. But there are other uses for this term where it clearly does have a moral potency, and uh, it's a lot worse than simple failure. In fact, the worshiping of the golden calf was not called an abomination in Exodus 32. It was not called a big transgression. It was called a chata gadola a great sin. So if the difference between sin and some other word that sounds worse is a degree of uh, uh, extremity, the golden calf creates a new problem for us because this is arguably Israel's lowest and worst moment in their um, relationship with God. So it's not a word to be taken lightly as though it's the bottom of the totem pole in evil. It's actually uh, got contextual history to it. In fact, the first time we find chata mentioned in the Bible is not Genesis 3, where we think it would come from, because the fall and uh, the eating of the fruit and the opening of the eyes of Adam and Eve, you think, oh, sin must be mentioned there. Well, it's not. 
but it does show up in chapter four, immediately after when God speaks to Cain, knowing that Cain is jealous uh, or at least despondent because God has rejected his offering in favor of Abel's. And God, knowing that Cain has a choice before him, says in Genesis 4, uh, verse 7, that sin, chetat, is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Now, from then on, carried all the way into the epistles of Paul, we get a personification of sin as this enemy. It's, it's a robber or it's a wild animal that seeks to defeat and devour or control humans. In fact, for Paul in Romans chapter 6, especially verse 12, we see that uh, it's almost like an evil king that wants to rule over us and dictate all of our behaviors. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's some demonic puppet master demon out there uh, named Chata that you get to blame all of your mistakes on. The Bible is crystal clear that we are guilty for the wrong things that we do us ourselves. And even if I envision for the sake of personal purity and the striving for excellence and righteousness, even if I envision as my actual enemy, if I lose that battle over and over again, I start to demonstrate a new concept. And that will be avon. Avon, which we often translate as iniquity, we probably don't use that, the I word very much these days to best understand what it means, but it comes from the same root in Latin as inequity. And both of those words are pretty good transla translations of avon from the verbal root ava, to bend something out of shape. And that's why my personal favorite way to translate avon is crookedness, because it actually carries the same spatial metaphor that the Hebrew has, bent out of shape, something that everyone should I understand should be one way, and yet it's crooked. And crooked means wicked in human behavior. Now, avon is a bit deeper than that, though. It also can be used for guilt or guiltiness. The, the fact that a crooked person is guilty and deserves punishment. And there we get our fourth big translation of avon. And it's just punishment. In the same story that we heard from Genesis chapter 4, Cain, in response to God's curse upon him, after killing his brother Abel, Cain says, my avon is too heavy to bear. This is not just, oh, I feel so guilty or, oh, I'm too crooked for someone to fix. This is my punishment is too heavy for me. In fact, we find all through scripture, this idiomatic phrase to bear your own avon, like to carry it like a weight means to suffer the natural rightful consequences of my own personal evil actions. And yet this is what's so interesting for, for Christian soteriology and for the way that Torah um, comes into the human story is if somebody else bears my avon, it might mean that they suffer in my place. They suffer the bad for the evil that I've done, but it also might mean that they forgive. They lift it and take it away. The same verbal root nasa is taken for both uh, meanings there. And it gives us our first picture of a way out from the natural consequence of sin and its neighbors, its sisters and brothers like Avon and Pesha. But that brings us to our third word today, Pesha. We often say transgression, and we probably use this word enough to know it has kind of a legal consequential meaning. Uh, but I like to think of it a bit more in terms of betrayal because in, this, in biblical scripture, it's a deeply social word. It's not just you know, crossing over a line and someone who's nitpicky is going to get on to you about a technical fault. It's about breaking trust. And we first find this in Genesis chapter 31, when Laban chases down Jacob and his family to recover some stolen idols that Rachel had been hiding. And after Laban fails to find those idols, Jacob understandably gets indignant and says, what is my pesha? What is my chata that you have hotly pursued me? Now, Laban had accused Jacob of a breach of trust between their families. Now, Jacob may have been known for breaching trust many times in his life, but this was not one of them for him personally. And when he asks this question, it's not just, you know, give me some accusation of wrong. He wants to know where he broke the relationship with Laban. Now, you fast forward a thousand years to the days of the prophet Micah. And you get a poetic answer to that exact literal question because Micah knew there was no particular answer given in the text in Genesis. But what does Micah say? He says in chapter one, verse five, 
what is Jacob's Pesha? Is it not Samaria? Now, there are different contexts, but he's referring to Jacob as Israel, as the kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, and Samaria with its capital, which is supposed to be this uh, courtroom-like accusation of covenant unfaithfulness for the nation of Israel. And then he follows it up with a parallel example from Judah, because Micah is condemning both nations for their unfaithfulness to God. But he gets to the end of his book, if we fast forward even further, just to wrap it up um, tonight to see how these three things play together. Micah has Exodus 34 in mind when he ends his book of prophecy saying this, who is a God like you, bearing a vaughn and passing over Pesha for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities, our pashut, underfoot. You, God, will cast all our chata, all our sins, into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Now, how exactly God passes over Pesha and covers iniquities and pardons sin is going to be the topic of the next two speakers but I'd just like us to take a moment now, ending here, to reflect on what these three phenomena of evil mean personally in our lives and how we can interact with God in coming together to see them eventually fixed. Thank you. <laughs>